Father God, we thank you so much for your grace in our lives. We thank you that you've given us your word and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would breathe life into it this morning. We ask that you would show us something about you and your love for us and our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had some of those times when things are really hard, where the effort required not to sink doesn't seem to be just an emotional or a mental battle, but it actually feels so oppressive that it's out of this world, a spiritual battle. I remember one such time when I was feeling <clears throat> oppression like that, and I was struggling. It was one afternoon and I had this acute sense of this heavy oppression. That's the only way I could describe it. I did everything that I know to do and it would not shift and it would not lift. I was lying on my bed, crying and thinking, this is nuts, like it doesn't make sense. This is so hard, yet I'm struggling. So I got my phone and I sent a text to two of my friends who I knew would stand with me in prayer. And I sent the message and literally in minutes, it shifted, it lifted. In that moment, I was thinking, thank God that you are here. Thank you that I can borrow someone else's faith when I seem short. Thank you, God, that I don't have to do this alone. And that was such an encouragement for me. That idea of borrowing is one of the things that we're going to be looking at in Elisha's story this morning. Last week, we explored the story of Naaman, a commander of the armies of Aram, one of Israel's neighbours. And Elisha didn't even meet Naaman to start with, but he saw a man, this man, take a long journey to move from sickness and oppression to being a healed worshipper of God. Elisha also saw how Gehazi, his servant, tried to extract benefit from God's grace and he came away carrying Naaman's leprosy. Today we're looking at a story which I particularly enjoy. It's a short account, just seven verses. And although it is a short story, there are a few observations that I think we can take away to help us reflect on our relationship with God. So this week we go back to the company of prophets, and let's read that from 2 Kings chapter 6 starting from verse 1. The company of prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet is with you is too small for us. Let's go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let's build a place there for us to live. And he said, Go. Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? I will, said Elisha, and he went with them. And they went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, my Lord, he cried. It was borrowed. One of the ways in which I sometimes meditate on God's word is to imagine that I'm in the story. What would it have been like if I was there? What would I see, feel, touch, notice and become aware of? What do I notice by doing that that I didn't notice before? I've done this for many years as a creative process, but it was not too long ago that I discovered that this meditative and contemplative process of finding myself in the biblical narrative has an age-old rich tradition as a legitimate Chris Christian discipline. This was not new. This was not my invention. This was a aha moment for me. This process, which I'm so familiar with, had a long history in the Christian church, and it had a name. The Catholic Benedictine tradition has a way of reading scripture repetitive called Lectio Divino. It means Latin for divine reading, by meditating on what is noticed and felt in the biblical account. 
The Catholic Ignatian tradition also has a contemplative process called composition of place, where the passage or the event is imagined and the reader then places themselves in that scene, reflecting on what they experience as it occurs. The intention behind these traditions is not to dissect the scripture academically, to understand it as a historical or even poetic literature, or to extract life lessons or spiritual truths, but it is a way to enter into the richness of the story, to experience and encounter God grounded in our physical humanity. I do not strictly follow either the composition of place or Lectio Divino prescriptive processes, but this is my way of experiencing and tasting and touching God in the story that he has given us. And I did that process with this story from Elisha's um, account. And I noticed some things that I had passed over. And I'd like to share a reflection that I did about this story. And I'll do that with you now. So come with me to the Jordan River, the borrowed axe, the company of prophets. That's me. I'm part of that. How life has changed. Elisha changed it. Not too many years ago, I would never have been game enough to confess my allegiance to God in public. Under King Ahab, our faith was illegal. There were arrest warrants out on priests of Jehovah God. Good men of God were killed, almost eradicated, killed like carriers of pestilence. But now there are so many of us that we can barely fit into where we currently live and meet. Now we witness the move of God under the hand of Elisha, the hands that washed the hands of the famous Elijah. I witness how Elisha has shown us how he sees our great God. He sees God is gracious and full of loving kindness. I get to see God through Elijah's eyes. I see God as Jehovah Shalom, how he has brought peace and wholeness to us as a company. I see God as Jehovah Jireh, how he provides. I see God as Jehovah Nissi, how he lifts up a banner in the victory of battle. I see God as Jehovah Raphi, how he heals. I see God as El Roi, how he sees all things, even private things spoken in the inner chambers of the heads of state. And God has given that sight to Elisha. There's nothing too small and nothing too big for our God to notice. And so we are here, and Elisha among us, working on our building project, expansion, multiplication, blessing. We see community operating like a choreographed dance, everyone doing their part. We are all to do a small part to participate in the whole. We are all to contribute one pole for the construction. And we are enough now that this will provide all the lumber required for the building. That sounds fine, but where and how? The wooded area by the Jordan is agreed on. Tall trees, beautiful aspect. And for me, it is a reminder of where Joshua parted the waters and where Elijah parted the waters and where Elisha parted the waters. Yes, the Jordan River is an appropriate place for a company of prophets to build a meeting place. So how do we resource such a process? We have wood, we have land. How do we access the tools this requires? That's a lot of axes and grindstones and hammers. We are prophets, not tradesmen, so we borrow from friends, from family, from community. Their generosity and support contribute to us being able to do what we do. Nothing happens in isolation. We work together. Sun and sweat and the smell of cut timber. This is family, bringing things together. Packed lunches, men calling some, whistling some, humming. The ring of other axes as men work. It has the feel of community festival community, everyone working together, everyone being together. It is a day to remember, the day that we were brought together and worked together to accomplish something, something remarkable. I choose my tree, its roots penetrating deep into the bank of the river to access water to grow. 
It is tall and straight and strong enough to be a pillar or a cross beam in the construction of our new building. I mark where I am to cut. I make sure the axe is sharp and I grind it carefully. I had borrowed this axe and I do not underestimate the value of having it in my hand. I start chopping. Wood chips fly. I feel the energy in my body focused on the physical work. It is hard work. It's honourable work. I, the fresh smell of cut timber, timber permeates the air around us. And then, and then the axe head flew off the handle. There was a moment suspended in time as the axe seemed to hover over the surface of the river, drift for a second, and then it disappears forever out of sight. Oh, Oh, I screeched like a banshee. It was borrowed. It was not mine. I could not replace such an item. That's why it was borrowed. I rushed to find Elisha sitting among those sharing their plans. I tell him what happened. Oh, my Lord, it was borrowed. Elisha is calm. Where did it fall? I show him the place. The water's surface is still as if nothing had ever happened, not even murky or stirred. Elisha borrows another axe. He cuts a stick. He throws it in at the place and the stick floats for a moment and then sinks. I hold my breath and then bubbles break to the surface as the iron bobs to the surface. The axe head floats on water. Those are gathered around me gasp. Elisha turns to go, lift it out, he said. Yes, of course, I scoop it out with such relief and I'm almost surprised by the weight of the iron in my hand. I feel a leap of joy and amazement in my chest and it infuses my whole body. A building project without God present is just an alignment of wood. My awareness now is not on the axe or the building or even on the project, but on the presence of God in this place. The axe was there, but I couldn't see it. God was here too, but I didn't really see him. Now he is here, and I see that he's here. His involvement, our participation in what he is doing. So now I also see God as Jehovah Shammah, how God is here. God is always present, always available, always there. Now I am aware he is here. I trust in that sharing this meditation, you can appreciate the idea of being in the story, how it feels, what we can see, notice, hear, smell and touch. Elisha is meeting with the company of prophets. Notice the shift in the land of Israel. These prophetic communities are becoming more and more visible. We often see Elisha resourcing and supporting these faith communities and fellowships. This is a big shift, notice, from the days of Elijah, where people feared to identify with the God of their forefathers. This is a community that loves God, is gifted by God, called by God. It sounds like church, feels like church. Fear and intimidation are not the dominant narratives anymore. And we step into this story during a season of prospering expansion. They are experiencing growth, influence into the wider community. They are declaring who they are unashamedly. They are connected and growing and belonging. They are impacting their community by being community. This is a community that is generous and open-handed. And we meet one prophet who, in his enthusiasm to serve, has borrowed an axe. He's a prophet, not a lumberjack, but he is in there giving it a go anyway. And he's not the only one. They resource this project by drawing on those around them. The axe was borrowed. The borrowed axe. This has been one of the challenges for me in this story. I remember listening to a teaching on this story and the main point I remember being presented was the idea that we should never borrow other people's axes. It was a metaphor for other people's faith or truth. We need to get our own. We use our own axe head to cut faith and truth out of the forest, so to speak. Otherwise, we risk it flying off and sinking. Hmm. 
I get the parallel, but this idea challenged me. And I think it's a relief, really, to give ourselves permission that as we engage with messages and teachings, that we're never intended just to blindly agree with them or even to flippantly dismiss them un or even uncritically disagree with them, but to mull over them, wrestle with them, savour them, explore them. And if an idea doesn't sit, why doesn't it sit? Is it contradicting what we know about God? Is it denying a principle or a truth in scripture? Is it clashing with something in our own experience or story? And this idea of the borrowed axe head was one I mulled over. Is our spiritual life intended to be so insular that we don't share or borrow or do community in our faith walk? How does that work within a faith community such as our church? Because these are the very things that I notice are the energy in this story. Sharing, borrowing, community, unity of purpose, working together. And as I sat with this story and I reread it again, the idea presented that in that sermon still didn't really seem to sit well with me. The story is set in an era where there was not a great deal of material prosperity. They couldn't go down to Bunnings and buy a bulk order of 100 axes to get the job done. They were experiencing a season of prospering expansion, but the prosper prospering part was in more people, souls, not stuff. This is a farming community that has been plagued by droughts and famines, which have been documented throughout Elisha's story. Materially, these were not affluent people. This expansion was evidence in the way God was restoring their relationship with God in their way of life. So how did they go about this? By borrowing and sharing. We do it all the time. We borrow tools, we borrow trailers, we borrow labour, we borrow expertise, we borrow truth, we borrow knowledge, we even borrow faith. When I felt overwhelmed and oppressed, I borrowed what was not able, I was not able to access by myself at the time. I lent on and borrowed from the faith of my friends. Why else would we emphasise the value of having people pray for us? Doesn't mean we don't or we can't pray for ourselves, but the principle of borrowing and sharing is something that we're familiar with. This is doing life together. This man was a prophet. He was a member of the company of prophets. By definition, a prophet is anointed by God's Holy Spirit to access the power of God, the word of God and his truth. And it is very evident that as one of the anointed men of God, he could pray and retrieve the axe head himself. Same God, same power and authority. But perhaps in that moment, he needed to borrow some faith. When we don't feel like we have the resources within us, this is a legitimate family, faith, community experience to reach out and borrow someone else's. I actually believe it is okay to borrow someone else's axe until we are able to stand and share and lend our faith to others. It's not stealing unless 30 years later we're still using the same axe. We're not being lazy. This prophet wasn't resting under a tree while someone else did the work. He was doing his part, working together towards a hot common goal, sharing resources, doing life together, being community. I pray for this, that people will come and listen and borrow and then go out and lend their faith to someone else in their moment of need. This is how we learn. I borrow that truth, that insight, that faith, and then it becomes part of what I understand and it becomes part of my own experience and then it becomes my truth, my insight, my faith. It changes me. I grow and then I can lend to someone else some more and lend some more and more. The prophet started by borrowing an axe and borrowing the faith of Elisha. By the end of the story, he had changed he had experienced something remarkable and learnt and grown. And it starts by reaching out and borrowing, learning and sharing. Resources are not always our own. Sometimes to accomplish something, 
to develop an idea or manage a problem or engage in the larger project, it's done well by doing life in community and doing it together. So let's read how Elisha resolved that from the scriptural account. From verse 6, the man of God, Elisha, asked, where did it fall? Then he showed him the place. Elisha cut a stick, threw it there, and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. So in this season of prosperity, we see that even when things are going well, expanding and developing and progressing, community working together well, energised and functional, things can go wrong. And it didn't go wrong because he borrowed. There's nothing to indicate he was careless or thoughtless or he didn't do a thorough risk assessment. It just happened. Stuff happens. And even if he could have done something different or should have done something different, sometimes things happen anyway. So what do we do then? I think we have this story because the prophet did borrow the axe. Perhaps if it was his own axe, he might have just copped the loss, been sad and frustrated and out of pocket. But this is a man who has a sense of responsibility for what is not his own. And that is the point which changes what happens in this story, because without it, we not, may not even have the account. He wanted to be a man who stewarded the resources that he was given responsibly. The axe head flying off the handle and landing in the drink was a problem. It was a problem even if it wasn't intentional. He had a sense of responsibility to steward well what he had been placed in his hand. And that is the part of God's heart that is responded to in this story. God is with him in this. I'm fascinated by Elisha's solution. He borrows an axe, he chops down a stick of wood and throws it into the river. I hadn't noticed that before. I'm guessing that Elisha didn't walk around with an axe in his camel hair belt. So to chop off a stick, he had to borrow an axe. He is now stepping into a place of identifying with what is going on. He also borrowed something to be part of the solution. He didn't renounce the borrowing, but he acknowledged it was part of the solution. Elisha didn't just see the problem, he saw how it could become part of the solution. He uses the axe to chop off a stick and throws it in the water. I don't know what God, strategy God is using right here, but what would normally happen when a stick is thrown into the water? It floats. Yet here we see no more mention of a floating stick. All we are told is that it caused the iron axe head to float. The stick goes in and the axe head floats. Iron floats. And I'm, my curious mind wonders if the characteristic of wood now becomes available to the iron and it floats to the surface. What is not normal happens anyway. That is a miracle. What does not have buoyancy now becomes buoyant. Characteristics from one thing are made accessible to the other thing. What is not seen now becomes seen and accessible. The axe head was always there, but now it is seen and can be retrieved because now its presence is exposed. But there is something else that I noticed that was not seen that we now notice. If I was in that company of prophets watching this unfold, if I was standing on the bank of the Jordan River watching an iron axe head float to the surface after sinking to the muddy bottom of the riverbed, I wouldn't have gone straight back to work. I wouldn't be thinking about the building project or the number of poles or about cross beams or an inventory of tools. I'd be praising God for this incredible, mind-blowing, miraculous intervention. 
Right then, I would be thinking about the miraculous hand of God. Iron floats, lost is found, debt is avoided, embarrassment and shame is now not part of this experience. I'd be worshipping God. I'd be aware of God's presence. Jehovah Shema, the name of God that means God is here. Sometimes in our hurry to serve, we forget the remarkable God we are serving. Sometimes what is important can get lost in the energy and the planning and the execution of doing something for God without remembering that a holy, good, righteous, merciful, incredible God is here all along. God is always here, but I'm not always aware of him. God is always here, but I'm not always worshipping him. God is always here, but I do not always have the faith in his enthusiasm or his willingness to intervene in my mess, whether I made it on purpose or it just happens. Right now, what's important? God. God is important. God is always important. He's always here, and now his presence has been revealed. I'm aware of it. I see evidence of it. I engage in worshipping him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the spontaneous leap of the heart that says, God, you are here. God, you are amazing. God, you are almighty. God, you are miraculous. God, you are the point of all this. God, you are important, the most important. God, you are the focus that I often allow to get out of focus. Paul writes this in his letter to the Philippian church, this encouragement. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice. The Lord is near. The Lord is not just here. Jehovah Shema, God is here. But the Lord is near, close. I've always read that verse as referring to Jesus' return being quite imminent, close. A caution, even a rebuke. In other words, the subtext for me was something like, Jesus is coming back any moment. The time is near when you'll be held accountable, so you better shape up and get it right so you don't get caught out. And I read it that way, despite the fact that that verse is surrounded by this declarations with words like rejoice, gentleness, not anxious about anything, thanksgiving, peace. And when I noticed that, I felt my spin on this was out of place. What I understand now that this is a beautiful declaration of comfort. The Lord is near, here, right here, close by. By definition, egus, near, of place and position, at hand, near, nigh, ready. Some transliterations actually say the Lord is coming soon. And Jesus absolutely is. But right here, right now, he is here, he is near. He is at hand, ready, close, near, attentive to our needs. The Lord is near. He is close, so close. No need to be anxious. We can pray about those things that are causing us anxiety because there's no need to be anxious about anything. Nothing is exempt In every situation, he is at hand to help us get through. And then, then peace comes. The peace of God that guards our hearts and our minds. Rejoicing in prayer is the portal to peace. Prayer is an awareness that the Lord is here, near, close, ready and willing. Prayer is thanksgiving and rejoicing in all sorts of situations, even when things are hard, even when things unexpectedly 
go south, even when things don't work out, even when the axe head flies off and disappears in the river. We hold gratitude and rejoice, not because our circumstances are hard, but because the Lord is near. He is at hand to help us. Let's take a moment to pause and reflect on this little gem of a story. How can I resource a project God has given me? Do I need to borrow knowledge or faith or wisdom? How well do I steward what I borrow? Am I careless with other people's stuff, even their faith or their prayers? Do I forget to keep our remarkable God in focus in my hurry to serve? How closely is my thanksgiving linked to my awareness of God's presence in every situation? John Wesley is is famous for being the founding forefather of the Methodist Church. When he was about 21 years of age, he attended Oxford University, and he was known as a gifted student with a keen mind and good looks. And even though he came from a Christian home, in those days he was a bit of a snob and could be a tad sarcastic. One night while he was speaking with a porter, John discovered that the poor man literally only owned the clothes on his back, just one coat, and he lived in such impoverished conditions that he didn't even have a bed. Yet this man was unusually peaceful and he was a happy person, filled with gratitude to God. Wesley thoughtlessly joked about the man's misfortunes. And what else do you have to thank God for, he said with a touch of sarcasm. And the porter replied with a beautiful smile, something that John never forgot. I thank him that he has given me my life and being, a heart to love him, and above all, a constant desire to serve him. Deeply moved, Wesley recognised that this man knew the meaning of true thankfulness. He not only knew about the idea to rejoice in the Lord always, but he was living this every day. Fast forward to 1791 when Wesley lay on his deathbed at the age of 88. Those who gathered around him saw Wesley's extreme weakness, yet he began to sing the hymn, I'll praise my maker while I've breath. What John had mocked made such an impression that it became his life habit. Rejoice in the Lord always, in every situation. With thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The story of the axe head is a short account set around the positive event of an exciting building project. The company of prophets are working together, engaging, sharing, borrowing. It's vibrant and it's growing. It is a healthy place for our community to be. And in one man's enthusiasm to serve, he borrows what he doesn't have to get the job done. But then he encounters a problem. What he had borrowed is lost. Elisha identified with the prophet's circumstances and used that same circumstance to translate the problem into a miracle. He borrows another axe to access the lost one. Elisha didn't see the problem He saw how it could become part of the solution. He saw how God transfers what floats into something that doesn't. What an incredible way for that situation to be retrieved. What is important, however, can sometimes get lost in the energy and the planning and the execution of doing something for God without remembering God is here all along. Yet this is so much part of God's nature that he calls himself by the name Jehovah Shammah, God is here. Sometimes in our hurry to serve, we forget the remarkable God we are serving, 
Sometimes we forget God is here, always present. And sometimes we forget that God is not just here, but he's near and close and attentive. Sometimes we forget to thankfully acknowledge the Lord is at hand, ready to help and support us in every situation. In this story, we're invited to remember God is near. We can rejoice in this. He has solutions for all sorts of situations, some miraculous, some in changing our hearts, some in just being willing to rejoice anyway. How would our life change if we always, without exception, spoke and prayed with a heart attitude of thankfulness? I think it would be a step towards containing and retaining the blessings that God makes available to us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you are a miraculous God, but you're not a far off God, you're here. Jehovah Shammah, you're here. But more than that, you're here and you're close to us, you're near. And we thank you that you are here at hand, ready to help and support us, regardless of what is going on. And we ask, Father God, that you would open our eyes to remember and to know and to acknowledge that you are near, that you are available to help us. And Father, you are also surrounding us with good people, that if we don't have the resources that we need, if we don't have the faith to pray what we need, Father, that you have set us in family so that we can borrow from someone else. We can borrow their faith. We can borrow their wisdom. We can borrow their insight, and they will stand with us. We thank you for the wisdom that you've given us in this story, and you ask that you will make it accessible to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.